Good evening, everyone. Welcome to WOW Live. Happy New Year. Word on Wednesdays Live. A new year, 2022. Wow, I you know, would never have thought that I'd be in 2022, but here I am, and you're with me. It's great that you could join in this evening. Great to have you listening in, and listening is going to be the, the operative word this evening. Uh, my camera went on the fritz earlier as I was setting things up, trying to test things, get things ready, and the camera just didn't work right from the get-go. Um, and it's a new camera. I got it uh, back in December, uh, back when in the beginning of December, when I had trouble with uh, the other camera went bad one night, and we didn't have much of a of a uh, of a podcast or live stream much at all that e that particular evening. So tonight it's audio, and I've done something a little bit different with the audio. So hopefully it's sounding a little bit better, a little bit more directed to you, and not so scattered here at my end in this office. So. Uh, anyway, we started this study of origins that we're doing uh, back on September the 15th. And so far, we've talked about things like how modern views about the age of the earth are not based on proven fact, but instead are highly speculative. We've talked about how the past is unobservable. Therefore, it is outside the realm of scientific investigation. We've discussed some major hurdles that the, that the, the process of evolution, uh, as it's described, just can't seem to surmount. And we've talked about the complexity of living things. We've also examined in some detail the hydroplate theory of Dr. Walt Brown, a model of global catastrophe that explains many of the features on Earth that we see today. But I can certainly hear this question rising above all of the information that we've covered so far. And the reality is this question seems to trump everything that I have said regarding the debunking of long ages of time, sometimes called deep time. This question just seems to railroad right over that and say, yeah, but what about this? The question is one that I think we've all pondered when it comes to this subject of the Bible and creation. What about dinosaurs? What about dinosaurs? And you see, that's a fair question. I can tell you all day long, and I can show you all manner of evidence that the earth isn't that old. But then, here are these pesky dinosaurs. I think I heard some of them outside tonight. It was kind of crazy. It was howling noise going on. It was either dinosaurs or coyotes. But anyhow, we know these dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, right? Even little kids know that dinosaurs died out about 65 million years ago. And everybody knows that dinosaurs and people did not live at the same time. I mean, we all know that the Flintstones are, are just fun, fictional cave people, right? People and dinosaurs have lived in different ages of Earth history. They couldn't even wave across the street at each other or anything. There was too, too much distance in time. We know this is true because, well, after all, it's a fact, right? End of story. Well, actually, this is no more fact than any of the other evolutionary facts that we have discussed in this series. To the best of our knowledge, generally, no one living today has ever seen an actual dinosaur. I'd say to the best of our knowledge only because it's theoretically possible that some kind of dinosaur creatures may be alive in some remote region of the world. I mean, there's a fish known as the coelacanth that lived at the same time that they say the dinosaurs lived and supposedly died out. And there's none around. The coelacanth is extinct. And then in 1938, somebody caught a coelacanth uh, down in the Indian Ocean, I believe, down in that neck of the woods anyway, around Asia and, and uh, in, in through that area. 
And it's like, okay, the coelacanth is still out there, and they have since found them and studied them, and that's that's like millions of years, but the, supposedly, and then the coelacanth shows up. It's they call it a living fossil, which is kind of a weird title, but they do, and, and uh, but because they thought it was dead, right? So it's possible that some dinosaur may be out there, some dinosaurs or types. Uh, if if so, then it's possible that in modern times someone has seen one. In fact, there are accounts of people who have claimed to see large reptilian creatures in modern times. I'm holding a book there entitled A Living Dinosaur with a question mark. It's by Roy Mackey, and and, uh, he uh, supposedly went on a search. He was a professor in Chicago, I believe, and went over to Africa, to the Congo, to track down the Mokili Membe, you know. And uh, that's kind of what that's about. Uh, but these, and there's stories over there that these people have seen these things. But those stories can't really be confirmed. If we have time uh, in, in this series, and there's no reason why we shouldn't, if we, we have time, perhaps in a future lesson, we can talk about some of these accounts. They're pretty interesting. The idea that dinosaurs lived millions of years before humans showed up is, is so ingrained in our minds that we just accept it as fact. To even question this assumption today elicits all manner of ridicule and mockery. The sad reality is that about 85% of the people who think that it is a fact, I don't know if it's 85%, but a, a majority of the people who think it's a fact that dinosaurs died out millions of year before, years before there were people, well, they actually have no idea why they think that. Uh, well, that's just what everybody says, so it must be true. You know, scientists say this, and it's, it's got to be true. Come on, there's the bones and everything. As I said in this past Sunday's sermon, Satan specializes in spreading false narratives. And whether it's intentional or not, and that is a good discussion itself, one worth having, our culture acclimates us to accept what we hear from authority figures as being pretty much true. We don't really have time to investigate things ourselves, and so therefore we don't really take the time to check things out, but still we will grant uh, seemingly credible people the right to tell us what it is we ought to believe, and that is basically what has happened with this overall narrative. A few years ago, I was teaching a group of children, ages five to seven. That's not really my class there. Those boys are older. Uh, But I was teaching a group of boys and girls, ages five to seven, right, kindergarten through second grade, teaching them about dinosaurs and the Bible. And so I asked the group right at the beginning, okay, kids, when did dinosaurs live? And almost as though they had all practiced it, Everybody replied in unison, long ago, about like that, higher voices, long ago, you know, something like that. Kindergarten through second grade, and they all said, long ago. It was like a rehearsed mantra, you know, a well-honed call and response creed, like they'd been working on it. Whenever the teacher asked, when did dinosaurs live, you kids say, long ago. Okay, let's practice. I don't know. One young man raised his hand and said, they lived millions of years ago. And some of the older kids even had a number, 65 million years ago. Kindergarten through second grade, and they know the numbers. This number, 65 million, comes from the notion that the dinosaurs died out in some kind of catastrophe about 65 million years ago, and that's the going figure. It's what the science books and the TV shows and the movies and the like all say. Dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. Even children believe this to be the truth because it's what they've been taught. How does the idea that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, square with this Bible verse, Genesis 1, 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, of course, I wouldn't expect an atheistic scientist to see this Bible verse as being much of a problem. An atheist doesn't give any credibility to the Bible at all. 
That's his belief system, to not believe. But for a believer in Jesus, there's a difficulty here. If God made everything, well, then he made the dinosaurs. And if, according to this verse, God saw that everything he had made was very good, well, then, that would include the dinosaurs and also the human beings that he had made. But if we're going to believe that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, well then, there's a serious conflict with this verse. Because being very dead doesn't qualify as being very good. If the secular scientist is right about the dinosaurs being dead, well then, Genesis 1.31 really doesn't mean much of anything at all. Listen, folks. Truth is not decided by majority vote, okay? And quite frankly, there are a number of very intelligent, well-educated people, people of science, who believe that dinosaurs and human beings have lived at the same time. And as we'll see, there's some very interesting evidence to back up such a claim. Starting tonight, we'll see some of it. Still, though, for a long time, the existence of dinosaurs has been seen as a real problem for Christians who believe the Bible. And that's why that question always comes to mind. Okay, yeah, all this about the age of the earth and everything, but what about the dinosaurs? And some well-meaning Christian folks have conceived of, and they have spread some fairly bizarre notions, which they presented as, quote, the answer, end quote, to the questions about dinosaurs in the Bible. Years ago, as a pastor, I got a call from a mother. Her child had been told uh, and told her that a teacher in a children's Bible class told the class that dinosaurs were a lie. The child's teacher said that dinosaurs were a trick of the devil. Look, folks, when, when I was a kid, I had heard that story as well. And I'm sure that some of you have. Now, I've personally never believed it. Let me assure you, the idea that dinosaurs are a lie of the devil is a falsehood itself. Dinosaurs certainly did exist. The evidence of their existence is simply too overwhelming to ignore, to dismiss, or explain away. Denying the existence of dinosaurs just tells our kids that the church is not dealing with the topic of dinosaurs in a realistic manner, and therein lies a large part of the problem. I want to tell you something. Staying with that 65 figure from 65 million years, about 65% of young adults are leaving the church today. And from what I've read, will likely not be coming back anytime soon. Research conducted on behalf of Answers in Genesis, the, the Creation Museum people, the people who have the, the, the ark, right, Noah's Ark out there in Kentucky. Research conducted on their behalf showed that 40% of 20-somethings doubted the Bible by the end of their middle school years. Middle school, 12, 13 years of age, and another 45% doubted the Bible by the time they reached high school. How much influence do you think the current teaching about dinosaurs had on those young minds? That's why I was teaching the kids I was teaching. Remember, nearly every kindergarten through second grade child in that group that I was teaching told me dinosaurs lived long ago. That was five years ago in 2017, not all that long ago. But most of those kids are in middle school now. And I wonder if they doubt the Bible today. Hmm. And then you often hear this argument being made against the Bible and dinosaurs. Well, the, the word dinosaur isn't in the Bible. If the Bible were true, it would have the word dinosaur in it. Well, it's true that the word dinosaur isn't in the Bible, but there is a very good reason why it's not there. As far as words in the English language go, dinosaur is a fairly new word. It's less than 200 years old. 
The word dinosaur was invented by this guy, Sir Richard Owen. He's 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 the guy on on the on on your your left there. Um, the guy to the right of him is kind of an ostrich, kind of long neck bird thing. Anyway, uh, the word dinosaur was invented by Sir Richard Owen in 1841. The bones of the creatures that we co today call dinosaurs were just starting to be discovered in the early 1800s. People had seen things like that before, but they were really uh, it, was, it was really generating an interest during this time when science was getting started. And so in 1841, Richard Owen coined the word dinosaur from Greek words meaning terrible lizard. Richard Owens was a Christian man, by the way, or Richard Owen. The King James Version of the Bible, which was the English version that everyone was using back in the 1800s that was using English Bibles, was first published in 1611, 230 years before the word dinosaur was even added to the English language. So quite naturally, the English Bible does not use the word dinosaur. That only makes sense. To further illustrate the point and a little bit of research that I did, uh, I decided to look up the word dinosaur in Webster's 1828 Dictionary of American English. And as I suspected, there are no dinosaurs in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, published 13 years before Richard Owen coined the term dinosaur. Why would older English versions of the Bible use the word then if it's not in the dictionary just 13 years prior to the time the word is invented? Obviously, that we wouldn't be in there. Word internet wasn't in there either. I took a look. Saying that the word dinosaur isn't in the Bible, folks, that's a non-argument. So don't give it any credence whatsoever. On the other hand, there is a word that's found a lot in the Bible, and that is the word dragon. Dragon is found 19 times in the King James Version. And the plural form of dragons, uh, or dragons, is found 16 times. That's a total of 35 times that this word appears. To prove my point, I have here on, for you some entries, or the entries for both the word dragon and the word dragons, as listed in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. Strong's Concordance lists every word that appears in the King James Version everywhere that the word appears. That's why the book is called Exhaustive. Dragon, 19 times. Dragons, 16 times. 35 times. And though we think of the dragon as a mythological animal, we would all say that a dragon is a kind of big lizard, and frankly, that's exactly what most dinosaurs are, big or terrible lizards. Suppose some Englishman uh, by the, who, who lived uh, about 500 years ago, this happens to be Sir Richard Bacon. Uh, suppose Sir Richard Bacon would see a picture of a dinosaur. What English word do you think might come to Richard Bacon's, or Richard Bacon, yeah, Richard Owen, Richard Bacon, you know, Bacon Owen, I don't know, owing for bacon, bring home the bacon, something. Uh, what, what English word do you think would come to uh, uh, Francis Bacon's mind from 500 years ago? Likely he would think of the word dragon. Oh, I say, it's a dragon. P pushing that further, what if this hypothetical Englishman actually saw a real live dinosaur? Uh, if he lived to describe to you what he had seen, what word might he use in the description? It was like this huge dragon. I never seen anything like it before. Did you ever give it a thought that with the exception of Antarctica, which as far as we know never supported any human civilization, that cultures on every continent in the world have stories and they have legends about these huge lizard-like animals called dragons. Everybody in the world seems to know what a big lizard is. It's a dragon. China, as is well known, has dragon stories. I think I missed a slide. There's, the, there's a Chinese dragon for you. Uh, from centuries ago, China has a calendar 
Okay, I just picked this up at, at the uh, uh, China King Buffet in 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 uh, Waynesboro, uh, right before the holidays. Uh, from centuries ago, China has this calendar, and it has a 12-year cycle. And each one of the years on a cycle falls under the sign of a particular animal. So it's sort of like their 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 zodiac. Well, it is their zodiac, but the, it's it's a it's an annual thing, not a monthly thing. For example, 2022 is the year of the tiger, and you see the tiger is the first one up there in the upper left corner, and if you're able to look closely enough, you'll see the year 2022 underneath the, the listing of different years there. The animals are the snake, the horse, the sheep, the monkey, the rooster, the dog, the pig, the rat, the ox, the tiger, the rabbit, and the dragon. Now think about that for a moment. All of the other animals are real animals. Why would the ancient Chinese have added a mythical character to a list of real animals? There had to have been a twelfth animal that they could have found somewhere. A kitten or something. You know. Perhaps they really had dragons in China back in the day. And people knew about it. Marco Polo famously traveled to China near the end of the 13th century, and he wrote a book about his adventures entitled The Travels of Marco Polo, and in part two of the book, chapter 40, Marco Polo describes seeing what he called large serpents. Let me read this description of these fascinating beasts as the way he, he, he lays it out. He said, leaving the city of Yachi and, and traveling ten days in a westerly direction, you reach the province of Karazan, which is also the name of the chief city. Here are seen huge serpents, ten paces in length, about thirty feet, and ten spans, about eight feet, girt of the body. At the fore part, near the head, they have two short legs, having three claws like those of a tiger with eyes larger than a four-penny loaf, and very glaring. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Others are met of a, with of a similar size, a smaller size, sorry, being eight, six, or five paces long, and the following method is used for taking them. In the daytime, by reason of great heat, they lurk in caverns, from whence at night they issue to seek their food. And whatever beast they meet with and can lay hold of, whether tiger, wolf, or any other, they devour, after which they drag themselves towards some lake, spring of water, or river in order to drink. By their motion in this way along the shore, and their vast weight, they make a deep impression, as if a heavy beam had been drawn along the sands. You can picture what he is seeing with his description, but what exactly was Marco Polo seeing? Huge serpents? He called them serpents. And his description certainly sounds dragon-like, or even dinosaur-like. India has dragon stories. Africa has dragon stories. And South America has dragon stories. Europe also has dragon stories. And the Middle East has dragon stories in its history as well. This image decorates the famous Ishtar Gate, which was an entrance to the city of Babylon. The Ishtar Gate, along with his dragon icon, was built by Nebuchadnezzar the Great, the ruler of Babylon who had taken Judah into captivity. Daniel the prophet, who was a captive in Babylon, served under Nebuchadnezzar for many decades. Undoubtedly, Daniel had seen this dragon image in the wall. And interestingly, the book of Daniel, as it is rendered in the Catholic Bible, has two extra chapters there. 
chapters 13 and 14. Now, we would not consider those chapters to be the true word of God. They are additions to the inspired text of Daniel. In the inspired or God-breathed Bible that we use, Daniel has 12 chapters. Somewhere along the line in history, somebody thought Daniel needed something more to do, and so he or they wrote some more material and managed to get it added into one of the texts somewhere. And now it's in the Catholic Bible with two extra texts. For our purposes this evening talking about this, it's fascinating, especially in light of this dragon image on the Ishtar Gate in Babylon, that in the 14th chapter of this extended Daniel, the prophet Daniel actually slays a dragon. So, for your intellectual enlightenment and enrichment this evening, here is a portion of that account, and I'm calling it pseudo-Daniel, a false Daniel, chapter 14, verses 23 through 27. Now in that place there was a great dragon which the Babylonians revered. And the king said to Daniel, You cannot deny that this is a living God, so worship him. Daniel said, I worship the Lord my God, for he is the living God. But give me permission, O king, and I will kill the dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give you permission. Then Daniel took pitch, fat, and hair, and boiled them together and made cakes, which he fed to the dragon. The dragon ate them and burst open. Then Daniel said, See what you have been worshiping? Now again, this passage is not the Word of God. I see no reason to consider it to be historical either. However, I find it interesting that somebody, somewhere, and for some reason, thought it would be an acceptable idea that the prophet Daniel could be a dragon slayer. Perhaps they were inspired by the dragon on the Ishtar Gate in Babylon. Well, the Greeks and the Romans had dragon stories. Herodotus was an ancient Greek historian, and he described winged snakes, which he observed in Egypt. Very strange account here. There is a place, he writes, in Arabia, or modern Egypt, situated very near the city of Buto, to which I went on hearing of some winged serpents, and when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to, desc to describe. The form of the serpent is like that of the water snake, but he has wings without feathers and as like as possible to the wings of a bat. Now that's very intriguing to me as well, that story, because Isaiah, in the King James Version, uses the phrase fiery flying serpents twice. Once in, uh, I got the wrong uh, reference there at the beginning of that. Just notice that. I threw that slide together in a hurry this evening. Isaiah 14:29 is what you want to follow. Psalm 118, verse 8 says, It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in Brian Black. So that's what happened there. Isaiah 14:29 says, Rejoice not thou, O whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. And then also in Isaiah 30 and verse 6, The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper, and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses, and their treasures upon the bunches of camels, to a people that shall not profit them. Now both these verses are referenced at a website created by a group in New Hampshire called Genesis Park. I guess they've set their name somewhat in opposition to Jurassic Park. They state their mission, the purpose of Genesis Park is to showcase the evidence that dinosaurs and man were created together and have coexisted throughout history. You can check out their website at Genesis Park, that's all one word, genesispark.com. Here is some of what they have to say about fiery flying serpents. In the authorized version of Scripture, King James Version, 
we find Isaiah twice mentioning the fiery flying serpent. Egypt is called the place of the lion, the viper, and fiery flying serpent in chapter 30, verse 6. This fits with classical authors describing pterosaur populations in Egypt. That's a flying dinosaur, okay? And and Arabia. The the Hebrew word here for fiery uh, flying serpent is saraf. It is used in Isaiah 6, 2, which you'll recognize, uh, in its plural form, seraphim. This same word is employed in Numbers 21.6 to describe the poisonous reptiles that bit the murmuring Israelites. Could those have been flying snakes? Indeed, it is easier to envision an attack of nimble flying serpents or pterosaurs killing many of the children of Israel rather than them being surprised and killed by common snakes on the ground. And they've got a certain point there with what they say. The pterosaur on the pole became a type of Christ, John 3.14. It seems more appropriate for this to be a pterosaur than a snake, for which from Re- Genesis to Revelation is always a symbol of Satan. So they're making a, you know, venturing out there a little bit, but it makes a certain kind of sense. In addition, the spread pterosaur wings on the top of the pole would form a cross, and that's kind of interesting. A 7th century monk named John of Damascus quoted in one of his writings a dragon story from the Roman historian Cassius Dio, who had lived 500 years earlier. It's an interesting account <clears throat> excuse me, about a Roman army fighting the Carthaginians in northern Africa. One day, when Regulus, a Roman consul, was fighting against Carthage, a dragon suddenly crept up and settled behind the wall of the Roman army. The Romans killed it by order of Regulus, skinned it, and sent the hide to the Roman Senate. Uh, I don't know what they were trying to tell the Senate there, but maybe we should do something like that ourselves. Anyway, when the dragon's hide, as Dio says, was measured by order of the Senate, it happened to be amazingly 120 feet long, and the thickness was fitting to the length. So, Greeks and the Romans, dragon stories. The Vikings had dragon stories. They had dragons on their ships. Great Britain, of course, had dragon stories. And the Native Americans had dragon stories. Now, the image you see here is a modern reproduction of what is known as the Piazza bird, painted on the limestone bluffs along the Mississippi River in Alton, Illinois. The original artwork no longer exists. And using 19th century sketches and prints, the image was reproduced in the, in the middle of the 20th century. And because the limestone bird, quote-unquote, of the Mesoamerican Indians known as Quetzalcoatl, the giant lizard creatures known as dragons are a worldwide phenomenon. How is it that cultures, with little to no interaction in the past, nevertheless share common tales about giant lizards known as dragons? It'd be easy to explain this phenomenon if every culture actually saw animals in their past that looked like giant lizards and then passed those stories down to people later. And we know that animals looked like giant, li- that looked like giant lizards. We know that they did live at some point in the past. What they call dragons... We've been taught to call dinosaurs today. Let's look at some verses from the book of Job. In this passage we're about to look at, God wants to remind Job that he is the one who is in control. He's sovereign. He does as he deems best. So God tells Job to take a look at one of his awesome creations, an unidentified animal that the Bible calls the behemoth. Job forty fifteen to 19. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. 
He is the first of the ways of God. The word behemoth is untranslatable. It's an untranslatable Hebrew word because no one knows what it means. We use the word behemoth today to describe something that is very huge. We got the word behemoth from this passage. Behemoth is the actual Hebrew word transliterated or spelled out phonetically in English letters. Some say the word might be referring to an elephant or a hippopotamus. But Hebrew has words for both of those animals, and neither one of those words would have been used if that's what, or either one of those words would have been used if that's what God had actually meant here. Besides, as we'll see, the description here in Job 40 really doesn't fit either the elephant or the hippo. Now, we know Job could see the behemoth because God told him to look at it. God says, Job, I made the behemoth along with you. That means that behemoth and people were made at the same time. The behemoth was a plant eater, eating grass like an ox. Elephants eat plants. Uh, hippos also eat plants. God says that the behemoth has strong and powerful hips and also a strong stomach. Well, the same thing could be said of elephants and hippos. And then God says that the behemoth has a tail like a cedar tree. Neither elephants nor hippos have tails that are like cedar trees. However, the largest land animals to ever have lived, the largest ones God ever made for land animals, were the sauropod dinosaurs, the Mementosaurus, the Apatosaurus, the Diplodocus, and the Camarasaurus. And they all had tails like big cedar trees. And God said the behemoth was the very first of the ways of God, the chief of the ways of God, the biggest animal that he'd ever made. You know, it really sounds like behemoth could have been a huge sauropod dinosaur, and Job could see it. Maybe what we've been taught about dinosaurs has come from just one particular viewpoint. Maybe the Creator has a better idea about the dinosaurs he has made than the ideas found in the opinions of modern people. Once again, I'm reminded of my life verse, and here it is for certain. Psalm 118, verse 8, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. But if Job could see a dinosaur, well then why is it that there's no evidence that anybody else ever has? Well, Besides the countless dragon stories that we've already hinted at, let's take a look at some ancient artifacts that indicate people did indeed see dinosaurs. This is part of a border surrounding an entryway into the ancient Angkor Wat temple in Cambodia. Notice the image to the right of the man's head. Got the arrow pointing at it. It looks strangely like an image of a stegosaur, the dinosaur that has those big bony plates sticking up out of its back. Here's a closer look at the Angor Wat stegosaur. It certainly looks like the stegosaurus that we see in museums and in images today. The Angor Wat temple was built in the early 1100s. Did someone see a stegosaurus? and then carve its image into the temple. You can't really see it in this photo, but there is an image that has been carved into this stony surface on the Kachina Bridge at Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah. In this next slide, I have uh, drawn a red circle around where the image is carved in. It may help you see it a little better. It doesn't make it easier to see much, but, but I wanted you to know where it's located on that picture. On this next slide, the image itself has been highlighted, and you can now clearly see this looks for all the world like the image of a dinosaur. Did some Native American from long ago see this animal and then decide it was a marvelous sighting, I have to recreate this on a stone surface, and so he does. Here's a vase. It comes from Peru, dated at over 2,000 years old. The creature is wrapped around the clay pot. 
who saw this creature and then recreated it in their pottery class. Maybe the history of dinosaurs is much different than what we have been taught by the prevailing idea today. In the background of this slide, you can see a portion of a mosaic known as the Nile Mosaic of Palestrina. It dates back to about 100 BC. Wikipedia describes it, the Nile Mosaic of Palestrina is a late Hellenistic floor mosaic depicting the Nile in its passage from Ethiopia to the Mediterranean. The mosaic was part of a classical sanctuary grotto in Palestrina, a town east of Rome in central Italy. Of interest to us, is the large image that I have in the foreground. Several Egyptians are fighting a creature coming up out of the water. The, the, the wa word shown above the scene is a Greek word, crocodilopardalis, that roughly translates to a crocodile leopard. A what? As our son, grandson Gideon would say, what? Here's an artistic enhancement of the image so you can see the crocodile leopard better. It doesn't look like any animal that we know of today, but it certainly does look like a dinosaur. This next image is not an artifact. You can see here the footprint of a three-toed dinosaur. You might remember Marco Polo talked about the dinosaurs or the huge serpents he saw having three-toed feet in the front. This print was found in Texas. But what's fascinating is that this dinosaur footprint overlaps into another footprint, a human footprint. You can see the five toes in this image. This is a cleaner angle of the same overlapping prints from Texas. What ought to be obvious is that the human footprint was made before the dinosaur footprint. The dinosaur print overlaps the human print. This means both the human and the dinosaur were there at about the same time before that mud hardened into rock. If human footprints and dinosaur footprints appear in the rock formation and the dinosaur overlaps the human, well, then there is something seriously wrong with the modern narrative about dinosaurs living a long time ago, as the young primary children told me five years ago. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed tonight's little journey. There is much more to come as we'll continue to explore dinosaurs in the, and the Bible in the weeks ahead. So I hope you enjoyed this. Give me some feedback. Let me know how it went, if you liked it, didn't like it, and... Uh, and uh, I'd be glad to, to take that into account and do whatever I can to change it, uh, because this is for all of us, not just for me. All right, And it's for the glory of God. May his name be praised, and may he uh, be overseeing you as you walk with him in the days ahead. God bless you. Take care.